Welcome to Loyola Marymount University. I'm Fernando Guerra, professor and director of the Center for the Study of Los Angeles. Today we have with us Sheriff Lee Baca, who has been sheriff of the Los Angeles County since 1998. Uh, he's been elected subsequently in 2002, 2006, and 2010, so he's currently serving his 14th year. He commands the largest sheriff's department in the United States with a budget of $2.4 billion. He leads nearly 18,000 budgeted sworn and professional staff. The Sheriff's Department is the law enforcement service provider for 42 incorporated cities in Los Angeles County, countless other unincorporated communities, the community college system of Los Angeles, the MTA, the court system, and a variety of different others. He, uh, Sheriff Baca is also director of the Homeland Security Mutual Aid for California Region 1, which is basically LA County and, and Orange County. Um, Sheriff Baca earned a doctorate, uh, a PhD in public administration from the University of Southern California. Uh, again, he was elected sheriff back in November of 1998, re-elected recently in 2010. He's been in the Sheriff's Department since 1965, and he also serves in the United States Marine Corps uh, Reserves. So that means that next year, you'll be celebrating 50 years. Well, actually, if, uh, I'm in my 48th now, so well, next year will be 49 years. So in two years, 50 years, <laughs> all, all with uh, L.A. County Sheriffs? Correct. Okay, and now you're at the top. Uh, it's elected position, so you're not appointed sheriff. You, got, you have to run. That's correct. So what prompted you to run for sheriff in 1998? <clears throat> Well, you know, we were entering the 21st century, and uh, my boss was a very progressive man. Uh, but I think what I wanted to do is what I've done, and, and that is uh, to create a public trust policing strategy, number one, uh, to operate from core values that were constitutionally driven. And when I say that, I mean the Constitution of the United States, the Bill of Rights, Civil Rights, and Human Rights, that the law enforcement community has not embraced the ethos of those particular forms of governance, and that's what authorizes us to have the authority we have. So I, I, I think it's great when you say well, you have to have courage and you have to have integrity and you have to have guts and you have to be all these things that are stereotypical to the police profession, but if it's not on the, on the ethos of our Constitution, the Bill of Rights, Civil Rights, and Human Rights, it, you're, you're, you're missing the point of why you're a, a a peace officer or a law enforcement officer. So, so those were the visions that I had. And as, you know, education does make you think this way. You know, you, you, you're more tuned up, not with a police culture, you're tuned up with public safety as the overall mission. So I had all these ideas uh, and you know, I tend to be uh, one that says, all right, constant growth, constant creativity, uh, that uh, all humanity matters. Uh, the, fact that your critics are your critics does not take you out of the obligation to protect them as well. Uh, I take a lot of hits, you know that, you know, I, I, I don't argue with the people that hit me, you know, meaning criticize. I just believe that the freedom of speech is something that police also must protect. Mm -hmm. And we, we are not immune to criticism. Uh, that criticism has a purpose and you, you can't take it personally. You just say, okay, the truth is, in government, whether it's police agents, there's no perfect police department, there's no perfect sheriff's department, there's no perfect mayor's office, there's no perfect anything. But what is necessary is people who say, we can always improve something. So that's what I got into, and I call this all 21st century policing. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you've been called a very progressive sheriff. As a matter mm -hmm. of fact, this year, he was just named Sheriff of the Year by the Sheriff's Association, and they talk about a lot of the innovations that you do. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of people consider you very, very progressive to have a very different approach in policing than many other sheriffs do. But yet one of your big, biggest critics is like the ACLU and a couple of other what we would consider mm -hmm. left or progressive uh, organizations. How, how, do, how do you uh, reconcile those two things? Well, we've had a long relationship with the ACLU since the early 80s when the jails were burgeoning with 24,000 prisoners. Now we're at about 19,000. Uh, so the ACLU is a monitor, a court-appointed monitor, and uh, we work with them. Uh, but their job is to criticize. You know, their job is to take things that are wrong and throw it out there, and then we have to respond and correct things. So, so what happened in this case in the jails, you know, we had these force issues, and there are some deputies that are absolutely 
doing the wrong thing, you know, and, and they're outside the core values. Uh, they don't operate with the maturity level that they should. Uh, and of course, there's a full a range of explanations for some of this, but the truth of the matter is, is that some people are not suited for this kind of work. And you don't really know that until they get into the actual job itself and then it starts to manifest. So, so the ACL has their job to do. It's to keep us on our toes, mm -hmm. you know, to keep me uh, well aware that I'm not an island and that just because I'm elected doesn't mean that I can do whatever I want. Uh, but the key uh, to, to the whole of uh, what I believe is important is that y you can always do something better and that uh, the public should be served by someone who's not trying to, I'm not trying to protect me. Uh, I'm a public servant. Uh, I've been dubbed uh, by the LA Times when I got elected as a social worker. I don't deny it. Uh, I think that social work is a high esteemed form of existence and I, I rather work improving uh, the lives of people in a variety of ways than just enforcing the law. The, the, the law has to be enforced, but it's always one of a questionable thing in the sense of how you enforce the mm -hmm. law. Uh, and and I, I don't like all the high drama and the bad language and the, the bullying approach. I rather that we're more sophisticated in what we do. Sometimes so we can't be, but. You joined the Sheriff's Department in 1965. How old were you? 23. 23. And you become sheriff in 1998, the November election 1998, and obviously you take office in December 98. So right. let, let's talk a little bit from 65 to 98, you know, when you're 23 years old, and you, you have to go up the ranks, you become under sheriff, you're, yes. one of the, you're part of the, the command structure, uh, and yet when we hear you talk about, you know, there is no perfect sheriff's department, there's no perfect... Uh, law enforcement individual, we have to learn some people aren't fit, but there is a culture in the sheriff's department. Yes. And, and it seems that you didn't become part of that aspect of the culture, yet you were able to progress. How, how were you able to do that? Well, if I may be so straight about that, uh, one, uh, I see life as a miracle. Okay, so you know, the first thing you got to have is you got to understand how important it is to just be alive, okay? And so then, if you believe that life is a miracle, then you want everyone else's li life to feel the same way to them. You see, so, so I have this intrinsic interest in all people, all races, all religions, all ethnicities, all languages. I mean, I'm just believing that we're all here to learn as much as we can, but you gotta, you gotta have some kind of a theological underpinning and, and you know, I, I say in the Interfaith Council, I have the largest interfaith council in, in, in a law enforcement agency in the United States. I have the largest youth centers in terms of the PALS program in the United States. Why? Because we have a lot of kids here. We're the largest municipal government, the county is, uh, 10 plus million people. And, and so the, the aspect of responsibility for positive policing as opposed to negative policing mm -hmm. is part of what I try to do. But, but part of the culture of any police organization or any organization is that you have to get along to go along, to be able mm -hmm. to progress up the structure. And it seems you were able to progress to become a, you know, a, a, a captain, a commander, et cetera. Right. And yet you didn't exhibit some of that um, worldview that you see in a lot of other law enforcement individuals. Uh, interesting point. I, I, I think I'll be more specific. Uh, whenever you get a job, uh, one, you should love that job if you can find that inside yourself. Two, the, the greatest way to succeed in this world in a job that's structured like law enforcement is you don't fight with your bosses. <laughs> you, 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 you do what they say and they're doing things to improve who you are, and so you have to have an attitude that you can learn something, like I said earlier, and not take on this obligation that you know everything. And the thing that allowed for me to succeed was that uh, I, I believed in what I was doing for the more noble reasons that it's done, mm -hmm. and, and not that I was just looking for power. Uh, I feel that I was given the power just by giving a life as a human being. So what are you going to do with your life? And, and I believe in social work, obviously, and, and I believe in education. And I, I, I think that 
that, that for me, uh, my bosses could give me any job and I'll get it done. Mm -hmm. And I'll work with others to get it done. And you know, that's what bosses want. They, they want somebody that is uh, highly motivated, willing to learn more, like going, I, I didn't get that doctor to get you to, from USC until I was 51 years old. And so I, I ended up having to go the long haul because uh, that's the way it was. You were working full time in the sheriff's right. department while you right, yeah. right. So um, when when you uh, when when you think about so you spent thirty three years in the sheriff's department before you became the head honcho, right? Correct. Sixty five to ninety eight. If you were to talk just about that period, what do you remember most about that time? What, what's the highlights? How do how will we describe Lee Baca, the sheriff, the deputy sheriff before he became sheriff? In terms of my first thirty three years. Yeah. Uh, give him anything and he'll get it done. Uh, I, I did the sheriff marshal merger. We had a marshal's office and we had a, a sheriff's office. And the marshals were in the uh, municipal court and the sheriffs were in the superior court. Well, we, there was a project to put them together. That was my project. I was the chief of the court services division. So I went through a lot of learning because I had to find legislators in Sacramento to sponsor a bill to put the two together and give the uh, board of supervisors the option to put them together. And, and so it was a lot of process involved, all new stuff, nothing been done like this before. And, and I had to figure it out. And, and I say to everyone here, that's what education does for you. You're not intimidated by the size of a project. You, you are aware that you don't know everything. And then you're willing to work with others who are smarter than you. And then you coalesce them into a force that allows for a process that allows then for a decision legislatively in terms of authorizing the process, and then you get the actual politics involved. And, and, and tr truly, nothing is in, in government is without politics. Mm -hmm. So they gave me that thing. It worked out. The sheriffs now doubled their staff on court protection, and that was one. The other was a, there's a small Harbor Patrol office in Marine Del Rey. Right. They sent me down there. They said, listen, go down there when I was a lieutenant figure out what's going on and see what you can do to improve services and then bring that patrol into the sheriff's department because it'll give us a unified protection strategy without separate departments. Mm -hmm. So I did that and that's what happened. They brought them together and the board supervisor said, yeah, we're gonna do it. Uh, so, so whether the problem is big or the problem is small, it doesn't really matter to me. What matters is I'm willing to roll up my sleeves, put my energy into it, and for the sake of the mission, get it done. We're at Loyola Marymount University having a conversation with Sheriff Lee Baca. Lee Baca, uh, sheriff from 1965 forward, um, at a time when there weren't many Latino sheriffs. You're Latino, you, right. enter, you enter a department that's mostly white. Um, uh, a Latino named Leroy, now put up with that, would yeah. you? Yeah, <laughs> so his, his real name is Leroy Baca, not, not uh, Lee, but we all call well, you Lee. Uh, identity uh, crisis. Yeah. <laughs> and so tell me about those uh, early years and, and the um, Chicano Moratorium and, and Salazar, because he's been back in the news in terms of you mm -hmm. uh, releasing some of that data. Um, did you even know who uh, Salazar oh, was yes, in the 1970s? Take us back to that time. I mean, you weren't directly involved in that incident, but you were in the Sheriff's Correct. Department at that time. Yes, I was a sergeant then, yes. And where were you during the, the Chicano Moratorium that was happening? Out there uh, on the street with him. And what happened? Explain to the students what, what, what happened. Uh, a, a couple of things. Uh, there were uh, a lot of people coming into Los Angeles, East Los Angeles. They were not from the community. I grew up there, so I, I know the community very well. And so uh, they were demonstrating over a lot of issues. Uh, I think some of it was discriminatory practices relative to farm workers. Uh, some of it was Vietnam War. Uh, some of it was perhaps uh, job equality. Mm -hmm. I don't know all of the elements. And at the same time, some were uh, uh, more radical, you know, not, not a lot, but we had a nice parade. Telecu uh, had Esteban Torres in charge of Telecu, and he's a, he's a good friend, uh, nice, nice man. Telecu stands for the East Los Angeles um, Community Union. That's right? correct. And it Esteban was, Torres became, ended up becoming a congressman. Th that's correct. Yeah. And, and so the parade started um, 
I think it started on Whittier Boulevard and it worked its way up uh, towards, I believe, Indiana and then it came north to uh, what is now Cesar Chavez Boulevard, which was then uh, Brooklyn Avenue. Right. And then it worked its way to the uh, park near the Maravilla housing projects. And then uh, people got violent. You know, they, they started breaking up park benches and breaking up uh, bus benches and the rocks were being thrown at, at the deputies who were just po posted to keep everything orderly. And uh, a young man, unfortunately, down on Whittier Boulevard set off uh, a bomb inside a Dempsey dumpster, but the bomb detonated as he was dropping it in there and it killed him and it killed, uh, it killed him and it, and, and that's that. And then, then there was a call to uh, Mr. Salazar who was, it wasn't a call about him, it was a call that someone uh, who was causing some of the disturbance ran into a bar and was with a gun, had a gun. And so that focused deputies to go to this bar, the Silver Dollar, and order people out. But the, no one was coming out, so they decided to fire tear gas in there. The equipment that they used was a flight right missile, which is designed to go through walls. Well, this was an open door, and it had a curtain on it. And so the deputy fired in with the idea in mind of dispersing gas, and what it actually did is tragically it hit uh, Mr. Salazar and killed him. Uh, Mr. Salazar was a correspondent for the LA Times, yes. also worked for uh, KMEX. He was a very well-known uh, Latino journalist. Exactly. And, and exactly. So obviously, immediately because of that, you begin with all kinds of uh, theories as to why, he, uh, what a coincidence that what a person who was the voice for right. the Latino community was killed by the sheriff's department. It didn't really help uh, community Latino relations in the sheriff's department. And there you are as a sergeant Latino, kind mm -hmm. of put on, on both sides, you know. And um, it's not until the, there's obviously an investigation and all that. And then recently, though, I mean, we're talking very recently, and this happened back in 1970. And so uh, th there was a case, or you allowed for the release of some of those documents. How, how, wh why did that happen? Well, uh, Mr. Salazar's children at the time were infants, you know, two daughters, and both of them came to visit me. They said, uh, I'd, I'd like to know what happened to my father. You know, we have a closure matter. I agreed. I said, you know, what I'll do is I'll have you read all of our reports. Uh, so they did, and then uh, they then uh, thought about it after they read the reports. And I said, you know, what I, the only thing I want to protect is your father's image in the sense of that his death was not only tragic, but it, it, it was gruesome because the missile hit him in the head. And I says, and I, I don't want people to pour over your father's uh, photographic remains. I think you should see it. I think that anyone that's close to him, like you, should see it. But I think that people get morbid curiosity, and I don't mm -hmm. think he deserves that. So they, they kind of agreed with that. And then about a year later, they came, well, we want him released. You know? And I said, OK. Then, then I turned him over to USC's uh, library. They have a section there where right. they have archives. And they have everything. And, and uh, but it, at the same time, uh, we did show it to the news reporters that were interested, and one from the Times did write it and uh, write an article about it. And he, he, he concluded that it, it was an accident. Now, the theorists, you know, the, the people that want to say, well, it was an intentional mm -hmm. hit on uh, Mr. Salazar because he's a reporter. Uh, the reporter that wrote for the Times the article was heavily criticized by, by some of the advocates. Mm -hmm that want to believe that this was some attempt to assassinate Mr. Salazar, when in fact the deputy that fired the, 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 the flight right missile into the uh, Silver Dollar, uh, he was willing to come forward and say what he did and how he did it. He says, I, I had no idea who Mr. Salazar was. He was a Caucasian deputy working in uh, La Crescenta. He was there on loan to the operation. And he didn't, you know, I'm a Latino, I know successful Latinos, I'm proud of Mr. Salazar and his legacy. Uh, so I knew him, but he didn't know who he was and he didn't, he didn't focus himself, well, Mr. Salazar is in there and I'm gonna shoot and kill him. Yeah. 
So uh, being sheriff, it's an elected position. It's not like uh, the police chief at LAPD who gets appointed. Right. Um, and you have four-year terms. But it's, you know, it's countywide. There's 10 million people in the county, about 4 million voters. So for you to run countywide, it's quite a task. I mean, that's like uh, uh, more than uh, about 10 states in terms of electing their governors. 42. Yeah, for, well, 42 the size. You would be the, yeah. And so it's, it's a very large constituency. It's a, it's a difficult election to take on. Correct. Uh, um, and it's not like anybody can run for sheriff. You have to have some experience in law enforcement. You, you have to be a certified peace officer in the state of California. So it's in the state constitution that for you to run for sheriff, you have to be a certified peace officer, yes. which then limits the pool, right? Yes. And so it's uh, most of the, and, and all 58 counties elect their sheriffs in, in, uh, in California. Correct. In almost every single case, it's another sheriff who takes over. Um, not always, there's some exceptions, but yes. it's somebody obviously in law enforcement. And so it becomes very difficult to unseat a sheriff. But yet in 1998, you decided to take on the sitting sheriff. Correct. And, what, and why you? What prompted you to do that in 98? Why wouldn't you wait four more years? It was pretty well known that he was pretty old and he probably wouldn't have served out. Uh, as a matter of fact, he died during the election. And so it's, it was pretty well known that he would probably not uh, serve out the, the four remaining years. What prompted you to go ahead and do it in 98 and not wait until 2002? Well, uh, you know, in, in 94, uh, the sheriff and I talked. I was one of his division chiefs, and he indicated to me he wouldn't run again. And uh, I thought, okay, since you brought it up, um, what's the plan for who's going to replace you? And, and he didn't have a particular plan. So I said, well, you know, I'm not anxious to be the sheriff of Los Angeles County, but no one else is stepping up to the plate uh, to try and get this um, smoothly done so that the organization has continuity. Um, so what, what then happened is that um, four years went by, or actually three and a half years, close to three, actually, three years went by, and, uh, and uh, the sheriff said, oh, I'm going to run again. At that point, uh, his health was uh, fairly, fairly uh, strongly in, you know, in, in, in challenge mm -hmm. because uh, uh, he had renal failure, which is, is, is not an easy thing to deal with and run a big organization. Uh, so but, I uh, think what happened with me... Know, every bit, it was kind of an open secret that he was ill. I mean, everybody kind of right. knew it. Right. And so, uh, and it wasn't that he didn't do a great job. It, it's just the, 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 there was no certainty... Uh, of health, that's my issue, right. and that's my only issue. Uh, but the, the 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 hard part is that he was my mentor. I worked at Montegran Precision Industries in a tool crib with his brother when I was 19, uh, and then his brother. When I told him I was taking police science classes at East LA College, uh, I said uh, I want to join the LAPD. And his brother said, No, join the Sheriff's Department. My brother's there; he's a sergeant, and uh, you know it's. A, he said a lot of nice things, okay? And so I did, I followed that. And so when I was at Cal State LA, a new deputy, uh, the sheriff was then a captain of the Vice Bureau and he was in the same class I was in. So you see, I've had all this long relationship and everything I, I, I achieved was partially mm -hmm. uh, him saying, okay, you know, take your test, do this and that, and then you know, I think you'll do well. So by the time I got up to the top with him, it was the hardest thing in my life to run against someone who I've had such great affection for. And all these youth programs I'm talking about, that was his idea. And I've expanded from two to, to, the, to the 14 we now have and, uh, and still expanding it. And then he put in volunteers from the citizens to come in the Sheriff's Department. And so I've got 4,300 volunteers working in the Sheriff's Department. That was his idea. So, so my payback, so to speak, was to make sure he didn't have his, uh, his tenure disgraced because I won the race. So um, you're going to run for re-election in 2014? Yeah, I am. <laughs> so you're letting it be known? Yes, I am. Do you expect anybody to run against you? Oh, sure. Like, uh, who? Well, right who, now... Who, who would run against well, you? Well, I don't know, but, you know, right now, you know, I've been 
the, the, the reason it's getting a little interesting right now is because I didn't have an opponent the last time. So, so I shut down all the campaigning and, it's, and, it, and there was no other name on the ballot. So it's kind of... So if you yeah. voted for yourself, you were going to win. <laughs> well, uh, there, I got a lot of votes. But, yeah. but, but, <laughs> well, you were the only name on the ballot. <laughs> true, but even if I had, I've had captains, sergeants, right. uh, others run against me. Right now, I think there's a sergeant from the LAPD running. Okay. So um, I'm anxious to hear what he has to say. But there's others. That people talk about the police chief in Long Beach, um, mm -hmm. police chief McDonnell, who mm -hmm. was the number two or three man at, in LAPD and then became, went mm -hmm. over there, that he's thinking about doing it. Sure. You know, others have talked about, um, uh, not that I've heard about him talking about, but they talk about him, and that's the mayor of Inglewood, who happens to be a former police chief for Santa Monica, and he's an elected official. I haven't heard him talk about it, but people always throw his name out there. So what, mm -hmm. what type of, uh, I mean, you're an incumbent sheriff, right. a very large constituent, very popular. What's the, what, what would be the scenario where someone would even be competitive in, in that situation against you? I don't know. I, I, I don't think that they, uh, they uh, you mentioned too, uh, both of my friends, I don't think they know what they're getting into, uh, to be honest with you, because they've worked only in police departments. Uh, when you're elected, uh, you're like, uh, you, you cannot leave the job. You, you, it's a seven day a week obligation. You can't go on vacations. Everything is purpose driven. Uh, back to my reason for being a deputy, uh, I happen to have a, a, a strong belief uh, in the theological explanation for life. I start off with that, that life's a miracle. Uh, I got the job of my life and I just became a deputy. This job that I'm doing today is a critical job for all deputies in the department and every member of the Sheriff Department, but it's more critical for the public. Mm -hmm. And see, I've never been at odds with the public, even before I became a deputy. Uh, I, I believe that the public has a great influence on how I think. I have all these advisory councils. I have Iranian, Lebanese, Armenian, Korean, Chinese. Latino, African American, Middle East, all the interfaith mm -hmm. are a part of the society, and, and I, I pay tribute to them. I, I, I am involved with them. I'm not just in the office. I have to go out after the, the work yeah, hours. You were actually heavily criticized by uh, Republicans, not from California, but from other parts of the country, for protecting uh, the right of certain of, of Muslims. Right, yeah, and uh, it, it was a, a, a quite interesting uh, dialogue that occurred. Well, and, and you know why? Because you see, all the religions—I don't care which it is—there's uh, always radicals that emerge in religions, and they want to twist the religion to satisfy their own inadequacy. That's how I look at it. Mm -hmm. They want to twist the religion to, to make things appear that they have a greater understanding of a theological world than they really do. Uh, so, so, so when someone says that Islam is a terrorist religion, uh, you know, theologically speaking, God did not create human beings for us to kill each other. If that were the case, why would we live in the first place? Uh, so, so the nature of, of my thinking is the United States guarantees the freedom of religion to exist. Mm -hmm. And when the religions start warring with each other, which has happened in the Crusades, it happened in the pogroms in Russia, it happened in the Spanish Inquisition, and, 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 it, and it even happened in World War II uh, with uh, a crazy man at the helm. And, and so the only thing that protects the public from crazies is people who uh, disarm the argument to be crazy. And that's what I did in classifying in Congress uh, before uh, uh, the congressman uh, in committee on, on relative homeland security issues. Uh, Peter King, uh, and, and, Congressman and, from New York, right? And I and I I believe that uh, public safety is not merely one thing. It's it's about the integrity of people's beliefs that are legally uh, legally protected in the United States. So it's a constitutional base too. So I have a major criticism of the sheriff's department. Okay. The sheriff's department takes care of the jails. Yes. Okay. And it is the policy of the Sheriff's Department that when a young person joins the Sheriff's Department, 
they go through the academy, that their first assignment is in the jails. Yes. Okay. And so they've never been out policing the community, et cetera. Correct. And so that their experience as peace officers has to deal with inmates, criminals, right. people who have been uh, convicted of crimes instead of being out with the community first. And it, it's, I don't have any data for this, but it just seems okay. wrong to me. I think that young deputies should first go out in the community and then maybe go and serve in the jails, or that there ought to be specialized sheriffs who really study and become experts in terms of dealing with the jails. Right. I mean, that, that's one of my main criticisms. Uh, okay. how, do, how, how do you, what, what do you think uh, about that instead of, in terms of having specialized sheriffs to do jails or not having all the deputies serve in the jails first? What's well, the purpose of having young deputies serve the jails first? Well, first of all, uh, it's important that they have some jail exposure before they go out and dealing with the real community because I'll say this about, you know, and I talk to them when they mm. are in their academies and I talk to them about serious issues. When I ask the de young deputies, are you afraid when you graduate from this academy that you will be working in the jails? They say they are. And then I ask them, are you afraid when you transfer to patrol of what you're gonna to have to do in the work that you're gonna be required to do. They all say they are. So I don't think that when you shove them out into some of our communities right from the academy that they're really prepared for anything. No, but there's less. But, but you see, but there's a, yeah. there's a belief that they are, uh, and I'm just giving you my answer. And I think when they're around prisoners, uh, they learned how uh, their prisoners think and they learn to be comfortable with the environment of being around criminals. Because if they can't get it right in the jails, they certainly are not gonna get it right as easily in the field mm -hmm. where there's less opportunity to interact. Uh, and, so you, do you see them first serving in the jails as part of their continued but training? Yes, but where I agree with you is that it shouldn't be more than two, two years, maybe two and a half years or three. And some of my deputies are in there for six and seven years, right. oh. and that's too long. Uh, so we're creating a dual track uh, so that those that really want to stay, once they get acclimated to jail, and they're not interested in more fear added into their lives, so they're going to go out in the field, uh, they can stay. What do you mean more fear? They're more, they're more afraid to go out into the community than to be in jail? Well, I, if, I if you, that's if, the last place I want to be is dealing with uh, prisoners. Well, let me tell you how we've changed that culture of fear. Uh, I embarked uh, three years ago on repurposing our jails. So let me ask you, how many officers do you have in the jails? About 2,400 of the 6,500 people that work in there. Uh, so one third of sheriff deputies are in uh, taking care of the jails. Uh, about a fourth. About a fourth. Right. Okay. That's a significant number. Right. Uh, but there, there, there's a, a value in them being there, but not longer than two or three years. Okay. Once they get settled and they learn how to speak with people who are incarcerated. See, part of the problem in policing in, in neighborhoods that have uh, crime issues is that the police officers or the deputy sheriffs should treat people with respect regardless of whether they've been in and out of jail. And it, you can't stereotype a public and call that effective procedural justice. If procedural justice requires you to operate within the rules of our Constitution, I mentioned our, our Bill of Rights and Civil Rights. So, so there's a tendency to gravitate to policing based on appearance of individuals in the community that, that are free. You know, they, they have a right to roam around. They don't have a right to commit a crime. But, but when you start stopping people based on appearances, uh, you're gonna get yourself in trouble with racial profiling and all those things. So what the deputies learn, and this is what I've done, the purpose of a prison or a jail is to educate the people there. Punishing them is a the fact they can't leave. Mm -hmm. But what we've done is we've created this expectation uh, for the public, which is a, a, a bad one, that we're here to seek revenge for the sake of the crimes they've committed uh, by not giving uh, these individuals much slack mm -hmm. while they're incarcerated. 
Well, we're not giving them any slack. What we're, get, we're saying is that crime is a manifestation of poor judgment and conditions that are uh, significantly difficult. When you think of school dropouts, you know, close to half or more of the people in jail have not finished school. Uh, you have people who are uh, coming from very difficult family lives and as children have been abused. And when you are taught abuse, you give abuse as you become an adult. All those things are what leads to uh, some crime. And then we have a huge population that have drug issues. And the drug problem is a self-medication process where people see the drugs as a, a relief from whatever their pressures are. Mm -hmm. So all these dynamics require uh, a sensitive understanding that if you want to improve crime, reduce the numbers, educate the inmates, and teach them the life skills, teach them how relationship building goes, anger management, how to handle tough things such as drug addiction. I have the largest drug recovery program in the United States. I have the largest domestic violence prevention program and intervention program in the jails in the United States. I have a veterans section for just the veterans because I think they're very special in the sense they've served their country. All these things are necessary to send a better person out of jail than the person that came in. I've got two tattoo removal machines. So let me give you the numbers. I have 8,000 prisoners in our education-based incarceration program. Monday through Friday, they're in classes. That's their purpose in jail, is to learn something new. We did our first annual survey of recidivism for that population. And I'd like you to guess what that is. What percent? Now, the state prison system is 70%. The county jails are 40%. So you're saying that in California, 70% of individuals who go to prison will return to That's prison. That's correct. And 40% of people who go to county jails throughout California return to prison. Well, L.A. County. I'm L.A. County. Oh, L.A. Right. County. Okay, now those that have been in classes of all those varieties of And is subject, that volunteer for the inmates? Yes, so you can't, yes. you can't force them to no, go no, to no, class? No, 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 uh, no. Because we try to force LMU students to go to class, and so, okay. <laughs> but so, right. okay, so 40% uh, return to jail, and of those that go to class, I'll guess half, 20%. It's 15%. If, so you can see a distinction. There's a control group. Those that don't go return 40%, and those that do go to right. that class, only 15% return. Correct. No, no, you see, those are astounding statistics. I mean, you know, so, so when, when de and deputies are teaching the classes mm -hmm. along with uh, professional teachers, we have three charter schools, so we give a regular high school diploma, and then we have two programs with GED. What, what's fascinating is that, is that I didn't expect that lower recidivism rate. I was going to be happy with the 20 to 25. But the truth is, is that men and women in jail have three psychological realities, depression, anxiety, and stress. And they're waiting for results of a trial. They're in process of whatever their tragic, broken lives in terms of relationships with their families, their children, and all that. So, so they have some real big things to think about while they're incarcerated. The time should be spent positively when you're in jail to rebuild your life. Mm -hmm. That's a social worker in me. And I'm giving them that opportunity. I'm not asking for more money. I'm not begging out that we have to create a whole new budget out of the state budget system or the local county system. I'm saying repurpose what jails are all about. Take those guards, move them off the line in terms of just one skill, give them a second skill, educate them, 40% of my last recruit class of 90 people have college degrees. In fact, I'll tell you that Charlie Beck's daughter, who was a professional school teacher, quit that job, and now she wants to come in and teach the inmates in the jail. And so I'm so Charlie proud Beck of Charlie Beck is the police chief of Los Angeles. Right. Yeah. And, and when, you, when you start seeing what the job market is like, and you have a college degree, and you don't want to go out there and arrest people and, and do those things, then you can come in and help restructure society uh, by using your educational so, tools. Everybody talks about your innovative approaches in the jails, and you get a, right. a lot of uh, kudos for that. But you've also gotten a lot of criticism in terms oh, of sure. how jails are managed. Sure. And there's a federal investigation. You yes. just hired somebody to really help you manage that. Right. Uh, there is the expectation that you're going to get even more inmates because of this whole dealignment that we're talking about, and we'll pursue that in a second. But what are the major criticisms that people have about you 
and the jails in, in the county of Los Angeles? Oh, you know, the criticism is, well, he doesn't manage the jails properly. Uh, you know, we did uh, our own survey of things and we have all these complaints. And, and I say, fine, you know, you, you, you're you entitled to say I'm a terrible human being, you're trying, you know, whatever you want to say. What I'm saying is, give me whatever it is that you need mm -hmm. me to look into and I'll look into it. And, and the ACLU was very good at giving me everything they had. And so we looked at 130 cases and we found three that were problematic. And so the key is, is that what do we do with the three that are problematic? Well, let me tell you, we get deputies in trouble a lot if you lie. Mm -hmm. So we were able to find out some people that lied. And, and, and what we do with people that lie is we fire them. Okay, but you see, back to my earlier point, uh, you can go in any jail in America, but let's take New York. Mm -hmm. New York has 12,000 prisoners in the Rikers Island system. You know how many uses of force they use every year there for 12,000 prisoners? And they, by the way, they have 12,000 professional staff and, uh, and security people in there. So they have one for one on their prisoners. You know what I have in my jail system? 19,000 prisoners and 6,500 workers for 19,000 prisoners. So I almost got close to one third of what New York has mm -hmm. in the way of staff. They have about 2,800 uses of force incidents a year with close to a third less population than I have and close to twice as many people and staff that I have. I have 400 uses of force a year. And the good thing about the yeah, criticism- Is this use of force definition the same in both locales? Oh, yes. I mean, if you, you put your hands on somebody and you cause them to have to move an arm or whatever, it's a use of force. It, that'd be minimum. Mm -hmm. But if you go even more than that, there's categories. So the, the key to the question that you're asking is, uh, what happens with criticism? You see, mm -hmm. it's not so much the criticism. It's what do you do in view of the criticism? So I have the, the first thing I did is I interviewed all the deputies involved in force, and then I interviewed all the inmates and then the inmates tell you what you need to know, and the deputies tell you how we could prevent some of this. So that keyed me to a force prevention policy, which allows the deputies to, de to delegitimize the use of force mm -hmm. themselves. See, I can order that you don't have to use force, but the policy should say you should find a, a better way to deal with a problematic inmate than to use force. You got nothing but time on your hands. Why are you rushing in to deal with this? Just, just calm the thing down, de-escalate it. Well, once the deputies are legitimized by a new policy, then we have a better way of dealing with this. And that's why I say criticism is imperative for anyone like me uh, that has the kind of responsibility that I have. It's not personal. It's all a matter of improving things. We're at Loyola Marymount University with Sheriff Lee Baca talking about uh, all kinds of different things, including the jails. And, you know, there are federal investigations into the allegations that the jailers, your sheriffs, beat not only inmates but uh, mm -hmm. visitors as well. Mm -hmm. and, and how how does something like that happen? And then when you are made aware of something like that, what do you do or what what is the procedure for that? Well, essentially this... Uh, when it, when it deals with the inmates, let me tell you the causes of force. Uh, now, we have 400 uses of force now. You know, we're at, with the force prevention policy and all that, we're, we're pretty low. So that okay. was la last year, 400 incidents yeah. of use of force. Okay, so let me tell you how it works. Uh, one third of the 400 cases involves inmates fighting with each other. Okay, and when they fight with each other, that's when we have to go in and break it up. So take that one third, and now you're going to reduce down. We have no choice but to do this. This isn't us initiating, it's them initiating right. us themselves. The other diagnosis of force is that uh, many inmates, because of the depression and all the other things, but beyond that, about 2,500 have mental diagnosed problems. Jails are no place for people with mental issues, in my opinion, unless you're a serious offender. But we use jails for homeless, uh, so-called management. The policing are out there. They're, they just take someone to jail based on the fact that they may have urinated on the street or whatever, uh, or sleeping in a 
yeah. uh, a place. This, this that, is an important point. You have to take the people into your jails that other police departments arrest. So that it's right. not just the, it's not the sheriffs arresting these individuals and then you well, dealing with well, it. It's we, the other. Uh, you do a, right. some arresting we, as well. We, we say let's we say let's manage a portion of the homeless population to the criminal justice system. Now, uh, I know my, for a fact that homeless people uh, live in a very challenged way and that uh, there's a lot of nimbyism. You know, no one wants to really build out a solution in, in neighborhoods that are homeless free. Uh, but the jails are the place. Now, I, we, we give them uh, a lot of medical care because they're entitled to it. And, and we, we do all we can with the Department of Mental Health in the county jails to take care of them. But when they are in their heightened form of stress, they get violent, mm -hmm. okay? And so let's not kid ourselves about this. You know, you know the, the, the nature of the, the circumstances are not necessarily a winning one for those of us that are in a public safety mm -hmm. role, but we do it anyway. Uh, so you have a percent of the force that's regarding uh, the aggressive violence of mental challenge inmates. Then you've got situations where the rival gangs are scheming uh, to start their fights in the jail. And, and so we have to manage that. Now, I don't care if I keep on listing all these challenges. The truth is, is that you can only lose reasonable force. That's the law. Mm -hmm. And young deputies uh, are good at this. Some are not. Okay, some uh, are too emotional in what they're doing. And when they're offended by, a dep by an inmate's insults and inmate's aggressive challenges, they overreact. So I have to deal with it. And, and when I said earlier, it, it, you know, those that can't handle this kind of work and get aggressive beyond reasonable, we fire them. Uh, but it's certainly not any different than any other prison throughout the United right. States. We just have more. We are the largest jail system at 19,000 prisons, largest in the United States, with the least amount of staff. You see, and, and so the more presence you do have a better effect, but what's cut it down more importantly is education-based incarceration. Mm -hmm. For the 8,000 on average, and you know, we're graduating every uh, month about 800 people, so we're bringing in another 800, and so progressively as it goes throughout the, the year, of the 200, uh, about the 140,000 prisoners will come in out of the system, uh, we'll have about uh, perhaps 80,000 80, 80, go through these classes, okay? So, so when, you, when you look at this success story, there has been one use of force from any inmate to deputy or deputy to inmate that are in these programs. You see, you see what I'm saying mm -hmm. here? That, that the nature of, of education for these inmates changes their perspective on jail. We've had five ask for continued sentencing to finish their classes. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and that, that to me is, is, is newsworthy. Right, right. I mean, some students who have to take an extra class in summer think that's continuing sentence to be able to graduate. But that's a different story. Um, realignment. Realignment means right. that the state is going to shift some of its prison population over to jails. How is that going to work, or how is that working? Well, it's working very well in our jail system because we ended up, because three, three and a half years ago, the jails had 260,000 prisoners go through in one year. Mm -hmm. In the last two years, it's been at about 140,000. So the low crime rate that the city has experienced and the county has done the same, we're at this 40-year low. We've had less people coming to jail right. on charges. Let me, before you finish that, we have heard about the low crime rate in Los mm -hmm. Angeles and many other parts of urban America. What accounts for that? Why, especially in an era of tough economic situation, we usually associate economic recession and economic right. problems with increasing crime rates. It hasn't happened during what is really the, the worst recession since the Great Depression. Why? Well, I think that uh, clearly the post, uh, Christ, the post uh, Rampart era uh, helped change the whole culture of the LAPD. I mean, Bill Bratton was a magnificent guy to set some things afoot, and Charlie Beck is backing him up. 
Uh, and a lot of people don't realize that the two agencies are, are back and forth with each other on the crossover crime that occurs with gangs and with uh, burglaries and with robberies and the things that are traditional to the, to the crime world. Uh, the Sheriff's Department, uh, because we're, uh, well, I'm elected, you know, we have a whole uh, separate sort of public accountability because the sheriff is accountable to the public directly and, and has to be a public figure uh, beyond uh, even an average police chief and even a great police chief like Charlie Beck. He's, he's a terrific, terrific leader. Uh, so I see our strategies coming together and, and I'm not the only police executive defending uh, the right to practice religion. Uh, the LAPD is committed to what we're doing at the same time. And, and what we have is a, a stronger respect from the community. And the narrative, when a person comes out of jail and they go back to their family, the narrative is, well, what did you do when you were in jail? They said, well, you know what? They, I had all these classes and I actually was interested in them. And you know, the inmates are afraid to go back to school. They had so many difficult experiences in grammar and middle and dropped out. And so we de-emphasize we de failure and we emphasize success and we emphasize partnershiping and that sort of thing. So, so the movement of low crime is attributable to people who are looking for something better in life, looking to be less problematic in their own world and the police are not inhibiting them. Mm -hmm. you know, so we, this has not obviously happened only in Los Angeles County, but throughout right. the country, because you see the low crime. Well, but we're the lead in oh, the no, country. We, we have some, some tremendous yeah. exceptionalism going on here right. in this county. Right. So I'm going to let some of the students ask questions. So if anybody wants to ask a question, come on over here, and we'll have you ask a question. But um, let me ask you this. So uh, you are the elected sheriff but your budget is still controlled by the county supervisors. In part, I mean, I have- How does that, how does that work? W well, it works well. Because you're still, in a sense, a department head of the county. True. And have to go to the supervisors and say, hey, we need more money or something of that nature. Sure. But yet you're this elected executive. It's kind of a, a, a difficult situation. Right, it takes a little finesse and it takes some balancing and it takes some communication. But the, my budget, and we, we've gained since you read my resume, but yeah. the budget is $2.8 billion. Okay. When I got elected in 98, it was $1,400 million. It was exactly half. Mm -hmm. And the department had like 13,500 people. Now it has over 17,000 people, as you indicated. So, so growth is part of this issue here with more responsibility. And, and so what the board is, is doing, like I am with the recession problem, my budget was cut $144 million in this current cycle. Uh, that's almost impossible to manage. And they, they helped me be, by refunding $22 million for increased workers' compensation costs. But, but where, where we are here is that uh, they know that I'm an independently elected official. Mm -hmm. uh, it causes them some concern because they want to make sure that I'm not gaming the budget. Uh, but the contracts that I have, uh, which are significant in dollars, uh, are managed separately than the county money. And so my amount of net county cost dollars is about $1,400 million. So you can consider that about half. Yeah. So when you say managing contracts, independent cities de uh, decide not to have a police department, but they actually have a contract with the sheriff department That's for right. you to provide the police services. That's right. And there are 88 cities in Los Angeles County. Of the eight, 88 cities, how many of those cities do you provide the policing services for? 42. So, for almost, so almost half of the cities are policed by uh, LA County sheriffs. Yeah, do we have a question? Hi, my name is Jeremy. I'm a political science student here at LMU. Um, I just want to say, first of all, thank you for coming and talking with us. Thank so you. recently, there's been a lot of discussion on gun control, specifically uh, banning all semi-automatic long guns, which are also known as assault rifles. Um, do you think that a ban of that type would be uh, in violation of the Second Amendment? Great question. Thank you. Uh, no, I don't, because when the Second Amendment was enacted, there was only one type of weapon uh, that was a single shot, and that was the rifle and a pistol. Uh, and it was a flintlock, so it took forever to reload it, it seemed like. Maybe if you were good, you could reload it in a minute. 
uh, what happened So we is, should go back to the original intent of the no, Constitution, no, no, only no. that you can only no. have a single shot that you no, needed to take a minute to reload. No, that's I not, agree with that. No wonder <laughs> they call you progressive. <laughs> that's not very progressive. That's going back to the ancient times. But, <laughs> yeah. but, but I, I, I would like to say to you a little historically about weapons is that uh, pre-Civil War period is when the Colt Manufacturing Company came up with the revolver, you know, and, what's, and that's what turned the Civil War. You know, the uh, North had the weapon and the South did not, and it allowed for a little more. I think the other thing that, that was helpful is uh, that we didn't have uh, assault weapons there that were long rifles back in those days. So it was just a pistol. Uh, I think, I was, you should know this, I was a member of the NRA when I was in the Marine Corps, and uh, I was on their rifle and pistol team. Uh, military weapons have no real use for domestic hunting or anything, including self-protection. So there's, a, there's, there's literally hundreds of these military assault weapons uh, that really have no business being practically in the hands of a civilian population when you have so many other choices. You, know, you, you can buy a very fine uh, rifle uh, for your hunting purposes and hunters, by their own ethics, uh, are people who pride themselves in shooting, if they're gonna hunt some uh, object, like a deer or whatever they're gonna do, that they wanna kill the deer with one shot, that, that, that they don't want the deer to suffer. Uh, and, and so mass bullets in animals yeah. and mass bullets in human beings, I mean, how many lessons do we have to learn that, yes, you can have your rifle, Yes, you can have your gun. You can have many guns, but you have to be competent. And no one wants to talk about the amount of deaths that people who own the guns accidentally end up causing because they don't care for their weapons in a safe way. Not to mention all the other things. Now, I support Senator Feinstein's initiative to renew the assault weapons ban. It's not unreasonable. It, 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 there's a, at least three or 400 other type weapons that are rifles uh, that are available for anyone that needs something to protect themselves. Uh, I think there's much to do about uh, misleading the public as to what they can do with the Second Amendment. And, uh, and I'm uh, happy uh, that I'm looking not for gun banning, I'm looking for regulation. I'm, I'm looking for owner competence. I'm looking for people who say, I'm not afraid to take lessons on weapon yeah, but, safety. But you are in favor of um, outlawing certain assault weapons. Yeah. You are in favor of outlawing yeah. uh, certain clips with a certain number of bullets in them. Correct. Right? Um, and then you, in, in addition, you're in favor of further education for you to own a gun or certain competency. Correct. Right? Um, and um, It's a responsibility. Right, right. I would say that a majority of police chiefs and sheriffs across the country take your position. Yeah. Yeah. Yet the the uh, the, the the experts, you guys are the experts, and, and you would, most of you are hold the same type of positions you have. Now there's always others that, that that don't, and and yet the NRA continues to win this battle. What what do you see in the future in terms of gun control and that and that whole politics? I think the uh, hunters uh, who believe in the things that I've said uh, are the, are, are have to rise up. And there are some that are doing it. That, that the hunter organization, uh, it really is an important uh, voice that has yet to uh, surface. Uh, it's easy to chase down the, the police view. It's easy to chase down the NRA's view. They put themselves out there right, pretty hard. Uh, I left the NRA in uh, 1970 uh, because uh, Curtis LeMay was a general from the, from the Korean War that took over the NRA and started hammering down the philosophy and ideology that we have today. The NRA themselves were opposing assault weapons Back in, 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 in the 60s era. Yeah. Now, that's from the original time of the formation of the NRA all the way up to late 60s that these were weapons that were viewed as being uh, not appropriate for domestic ownership. What changed? Yeah. Next question. Hi, Sheriff Baca. Hi. My name is Michael Hanover, and um, first of all, thank you very much for being with us today. My, My question is uh, focused sort of on uh, gang-related gang criminal activity. 
First of all, I guess, what's your overall assessment of the situation today in the Los Angeles community uh, having to do with gangs? What sort of criminal activity are your deputies on the streets faced with most, most often? Um, and I guess that's it, pretty much just if you could give us sort of an overview of the gang situation. Okay, well, thank you, Michael. I, thank you. Uh, I think we have some good news in that area. Uh, one, uh, the gang murders are down at a historic low in the city of LA, and they're also significantly down in the county areas and throughout the independent cities. So that's a positive. But the substitute is, is that they've come together and realized that if they deal drugs competitively uh, in neighborhoods, that's what causes a lot of the, 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 the armament and they shoot each other because they don't want someone else selling drugs in their area and yet they're right next to each other. So, so they change their strategy. The penalties are very harsh for shooting and killing people, as you know. So they came into this idea of burglarizing in the daytime houses in affluent neighborhoods. Okay, places like Pasadena, San Marino, uh, Diamond Bar, uh, Santa Clarita, they, they go in the daytime, they go up to the front door, knock on the door, no answer, then they're going to action. And they go in uh, on usually a side entry or back entry, and they quickly go into the place that they think would be where the, the jewels are that a woman would own. And the gold, they're looking for the gold and the diamonds. And then they come out of the house. Now, Entering a house unoccupied is a lesser penalty than an occupied house. And so it's a very minimal crime in terms of punishment. So that part has changed their strategy about violence versus uh, nonviolence. And, and, and so they're being very successful. You know, we have uh, task forces, LAPD, Sheriff's Department, and others. And we're all over the place trying to intercede with these kinds of daytime operations. So that's one. Uh, the, the other is there's still those violent gangs, you know, they're, they're not going to go away entirely. Uh, and they're kind of driven by the uh, habituated uh, in and out of jail intellect that some of them have. That they, 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 they have kind of like given up on whatever legal way of living they're in. They support themselves through uh, what they do in the drug dealing world. And so it's still out there. Uh, where uh, I think it's going to go. We used to have more gang members that we could put in our files than we do today. It was at one time 150,000, and now it's right around 70 to 80,000. Bear in mind of the 70 to 80,000, probably less than 5% will ever contemplate violence. So this idea that all these gangs are running around ready to kill everybody is a myth. And I'll tell you what's interesting in my job as a public official. I eat in a lot of the places in the community. You know, I'll, I'll go to a Tams in Compton. You know, it's a place where you get all these burgers and everything that you, before you're through, you're you 10,000 calories. But, <laughs> but when, I, when I go anywhere in, in neighborhoods that have, uh, you know, a lesser economic level than others, uh, a lot of gang members, uh, you know, guys are all tatted up, whatever. They come up and they want to say hi. I say hi to them and we talk. And then if they have a little child with them, they'll say, hey, can you do me a favor, sir? Can you take a picture with my daughter? You know, so I'll take the picture with the daughter, and, and we'll get into this. And so, so what I try to encourage is that, listen, you can't just sneer at people. You know, you, you, you have to respect them. And then you say, hey, you know, uh, that's a beautiful child you have there. I, mean, I, I, really, I really hope you, you know, you're going to help her get to a better future in life and all that. But they, they, they kind of like the inner, inner dialogue. And when I go to the jails, you know, uh, I, I don't walk through the jails and look at the inmates through the bars. I always say, hey, how are you? How are you holding up? And, you know, are you staying strong? Oh, yes, sir, I'm staying strong. I say, well, you got to stay strong. You know, you know, so, so they're used to negative all the time. But, but we're trying to get to the place where hey, you can keep, treat people with respect, even if you know they're going to commit a crime the next day that you won't find out about. Uh, but the narrative should never be that the police are abusive, you see, that's where we go wrong with gang members or anybody else. You just can't do it. And I'm tight with Father Boyle, and I'm tight with all these programs, and then, and then I got this tattoo removal, two tattoo removal machines, because a lot of them want to take off the tattoos, man. They got a girlfriend on the neck. Well, that girlfriend's gone, man. She's, <laughs> she, she dumped him a long time ago. 
And he said, I'm tired of that name on my neck. I want to take it off. I said, what other name are you going to put on? No, 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 no more tattoos. I one had three girls' tattoos, one different girls. And he finally says, I, I guess I've lost my, my lure or something. But <laughs> yeah, especially when you're in jail. It's, but, tough to, it's tough to date when you're in jail. Yeah. Exactly. Next question. Hello, my name's Bianca. Um, thank you for your service, sir. Thank you, Bianca, for saying um, <clears throat> Recently, LAPD chief back announced that undocumented immigrants arrested for low-level crimes would no longer be turned over to federal authorities for deportation. As someone with almost 50 years in law enforcement, mm -hmm. how do you feel about this decision in regards to your duty to uphold the laws of the United States? Well, I, I support Charlie's point of view, and but let me tell you what I do, which I, I think was more uh, part of that message. But your, your policy is different than his. Oh, not much, but here's how you had to change it. Uh, the way you change things in this country is you go to the source that causes the difficulty. So I called the director of ICE. ICE is the Immigration Custom Enforcement Agency, John Morton. I says, John, you got all these sheriffs that have people come to jail on misdemeanor offenses that are undocumented, and there's a constant concern on the civil rights side of this issue that they're being deported. Uh, when we wanted help from the federal government on serious criminals, you know, murderers, drug dealers, uh, heavy-duty, uh, violent people, gangs like Mara Chavez Rucha from El Salvador, uh, we wanted the feds to deport those guys. So, but they started the Secure Communities Program uh, on a different note. <laughs> Uh, and they, then they allowed for this lower level offense to be tagged in, and, and they selectively deported these people as well. So I got Morton to come out to California. I called the governor and I said, you gotta come in here. And I recommended to change their policy like what Mr. Beck has done. You see, you can't just walk off on your own and say, we're gonna do nothing uh, in terms of these certain cases. You gotta kind of make it more legitimate that, that the federal government has a responsibility to change their policy too. So if we're gonna do the first phase, like Charlie took a, stuck his neck out, and I'm gonna stick my neck out with Charlie, I want the federal government to say yes to what I'm doing. I don't wanna be recalcitrant to the national obligations that we have. So we changed, we, we changed the law, and, and we we rewritten into the new law what Charlie was saying. So today, we don't have this problem to the extent that we did before those changes were made. But I went to the federal source first, gave them suggestions, they incorporated them, and so we're right now in line with what Charlie did. So, so basically, same objective, but two ways of, uh, of dealing with it is how you're talking about. Right, because right. my fear is, is you, know, you know, if you do it for a good reason, like you're suggesting by your question, uh, and, and, and you don't check with the authorities that are causing the problem and cage it there as well, uh, then who's to, who's to prevent a Jor Arpaio? You know, the guys like Jor, the, Jor Arpaio- the, the sheriff from Phoenix or it, Maricopa it, County. Is somebody who has lost uh, a perspective on, on, on this issue. But you see, I, I even go a step further. Uh, it's well known in the White House and, in, and even in the Department of Justice, what I do here, in spite of the jail problems and yeah. investigations and all that. And, and President Obama's staff invited me to the White House to deal with this immigration issue as it stands today for the full legalization path. And, and so I go forward with the idea that people who are undocumented are needed by the American economy, not just tolerated by the American economy, needed. We could not manufacture what we have to. We could not get all of our produce to market and our food to market without these individuals. Uh, there is an absolute need to legalize. I'm not saying make a citizen right away. I'm just saying legalize workers, give them that legal status so they can get their driver's license to go along with their job obligation, and don't make the employers uh, criminals because they need these people uh, to do the jobs that they can't find yeah. the American citizens to do. 
so, so, so the, the theories uh, of what you propounded with the, this one question is it's more than just that. It, yeah. it, it's a whole lot of things that I think uh, human people, humanitarian people need to be on the side of. And there's no more respected voice than law enforcement on these issues. We have time for one more question. Uh, first and foremost, thank you, Mr. Baca, for taking the time to come and speak in our school. Um, my question is in regards to uh, downtown Los Angeles and the, mm -hmm. the homeless situation. Yes. Especially on Skid Row, if you've been, if we've seen any um, progression or digression in that. Thank you for asking that question because when I first got elected, I got deep into it. I wanted to have a transition village built near the jails on a lot that was a hydro plant, and so I went. Uh, all over the place. I got involved with uh, then Mayor Hahn, and uh, I, I couldn't get any political traction, okay, being frank to you. You know, I, it, was a, it was a transition place. I would secure it. Well, the first thing I got was pushback from the Chinatown area, and they said, you know, this is Chinatown, you're building this on. I said, it, it doesn't matter where it's next to Chinatown. What matters is that it's sensible. And it'll help you. You know, it'll keep them from uh, you know doing things that you don't like them doing because we're managing it properly. Uh, so, so then uh, I went into actual Skid Row downtown LA, and I saw you know it gets filthy over there, right? A lot of people there. They're sleeping on the sidewalks and all that. So I got the inmates out of the jail uh, to clean up the sidewalks. You know, to say, hey, we're not taking anything. We're just we're just going to wash down the sidewalks, pick up all the trash and do the things that make life a little more habitable for you, even if it's on the street. Well, I get a call from the attorney general there, not the attorney general, the, uh, the city attorney, a uh, nice man. He says, do you know there's an injunction in, against us from doing what you're doing? I says, well, yeah, you, you know, is there an injunction? What does that mean? Uh, we're not bothering anybody. We're just trying to make it as clean as possible since they are forced to live on the street. Uh, so so the, the whole thing about this homeless, uh, became uh, a big deal because I was the one that was in the front line of the whole idea of doing things. And, and, and yet, when I, when I was told I can't do it near Chinatown, then I went to 105th in Vermont, under, uh, where a parking structure or parking lot for the blue line coming in was totally unoccupied because too much vandalism going on there. So I said, okay, then let's do it with the women and the children because there's like 200 children back then that were on the streets with their mothers in these little shanties they put together in places they could. And so I said, okay, let's build something for the children on 105th in Vermont. So Caltrans owned the property. So I went to Caltrans. They're willing to give me the property for free. And guess what happened? There was a church down the roadway on Vermont that said No. And this is sad because underneath the freeway are homeless people already living there now. And, and, and I'm saying, well, wait, wait a minute, you know, this is a church. Well, what happened to Jesus, you know? <laughs> what, 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 what happened to the poor washing the feet? You know, Jesus washes the feet of two people before he was crucified. You know, you know what, what happened to all that? And, well, we'd like you to think of other things and on and on. on. So, so uh, I just then went to the Bell Shelter. You know where the Bell Shelter is? Is in Bell. And so I got the director of mental health with some assistance of others to give $4 million to the Bell Shelter to modernize the homeless program they got going on there. So they, they did a beautiful job, expanded the, the space and so forth. But you see how this works? You know, you, you, you just got too many people that just don't want to do anything about this. And those that do are handcuffed and, and, and are stopped and blocked because of yeah, political considerations. Always, so there are all kinds of other issues that we want to talk to you about. Uh, uh, Paul Tanaka and his resignation, sure. the use of drones in, in, in the county of Los Angeles, yes. and all kinds of other things. But we unfortunately have run out of time. Run out of time. And we really do appreciate you coming here well, to Loyola you. Marymount University. Thank, thank you, you very much. Appreciate Thanks. It. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, guys, we'll, we'll see you next week. <laughs>